Another point I think that is really important to keep in mind here is that even as some countries become wealthier and wealthier under the current global growth ethic, uh, keep in mind that the whole idea of the enterprise is to raise the poorest nations of the world at least to livable incomes. Now, the growth model is failing because what report after report shows is that something like 80% of the total benefits of economic growth are going to the top 20%, the people who already have it. And there's no evidence whatsoever that they benefit any longer from that. So that if you look at countries like the United States, Canada, and most European countries, there's no evidence that any further income growth can add to, for example, most measures that go into the United Nations Human Development Index. Um, longevity, infant mortality, the uh, post-operative survival, literacy, all of those things top out at about eight or nine thousand international dollars per year. And then it's just flatlining. So here we have an ironic situation where the most intelligent species on the planet is arguing that growth should be uh, the primary goal of development. When in fact most of the benefits of growth are going to that segment of the global population who least need it, for whom there is no demonstrable benefit in terms of measures of population health. Secondly, in survey after survey, some going back for 40 years, we can show that there's no uh, perceived or felt improvement in well-being with higher income beyond that magic level as well. So it looks as if in terms of neither objective nor subjective indicators, those countries which are benefiting most from the global growth paradigm are in fact uh, benefiting in terms of um, improvements in population health or the felt well-being of their countries. So GDP per capita rises, but in some places such as the United States, the number of people reporting themselves as happy or very happy, for example, is in steady decline, has been for a number of years. So if we were truly an intelligent species, we would recognize that the prudative objective of growth has long since been satisfied in the rich countries. We're three, four, five times as wealthy as is needed to reach the maximum level of benefit in terms of objective indicators as well as subjective ones. And since there are still about a billion people, 850 million who don't get enough calories, another three and a half billion or at least three billion in total who uh, are suffering from some form of nutritive disease, uh, malnutrition of some kind or other because of, of some nutrient um, deficit, we ought to be redirecting the benefits of global growth to those countries and people that need it. Um, so if we must grow, it requires stopping growth and indeed reducing it in the richest countries in order that the poorest members of the human family can rise to the point where life at least has some positive attributes and, and benefit. We're not willing to do that. What we want to do instead and insist on our, our, our ability to do is to keep raising the entire scale of the human enterprise. The pie gets bigger in the theory that the, even the thinnest wedge will grow at the edge and ultimately the poorest of the poor will have sufficiency. Well, that simply won't work any longer if we passed the biophysical limits to growth. As pursuing this path puts us over the top into a state of both geopolitical and uh, ecological chaos from which we may not emerge. And that's, that's my primary concern today. There's another element to this that I think is really important. What the data show is that uh, countries that have relative equity in terms of income disparity, even if they're relatively poor, tend to be content countries. Rich countries with widespreads in incomes tend to be unhappier There's the, uh, with um, unhealthier populations. So it seems that it's not the absolute level of income, but rather relative incomes, once you have sufficiency, that contributes most to a state of well-being, political stability, population health, and so on and so forth. Again, knowing that, we should be striving globally to reduce the gap in incomes, both within and between countries. Instead, most of the policies in place today in the United States, in Canada, in, in um, much of the rest of the developed world is increasing the income gap. What we're seeing is a steady erosion of equity, which is a recipe for increasing malcontent, uh, discontent rather, within, within those populations. So 
again, if you take the perspective that humans are allegedly evidence of intelligent life on Earth, we really have to question, what is it that causes us to act in ways that are counter the evidence? Intelligence is manifest in science and in analysis and so on and so forth. The data are there for us to pay attention to, and yet there's something else driving us that has to do with innate behaviors, it has to do with politics, it has to do with status and prestige, it has to do with a whole variety of other things that are, quite frankly, irrational. And so I would argue that we are really much more an irrational organism than a rational one, despite our, our best intents. Some would say that's a good thing. I think we need more balance between reason and uh, pure emotive responses and, and innate and political responses to these circumstances. Right now, we're, we're losing it because we can't come to grips with our own irrationality, particularly at, at the global level.